Hello and welcome to this Farm Advisory Service webinar. My name is Alexander Purry and I will be your host for tonight. Tonight I'm joined by two particularly special speakers and we're going to be covering the, uh, the Hedgehog Carbon Code and the nature conservation benefits of hedges. All right, so thank you for joining us this evening. Um, if you're new to our Farm Advisory Service webinar, um, we are going to take a, a kind of brief introduction here and then we'll break out into the two presentations for this evening. Um, please do uh, make yourselves known as we as we go ahead with the, the webinar and uh, do use the chat and Q&A functions at any point. And uh, I'll be monitoring that as we go through the two presentations and there's an opportunity for an open Q&A towards the end of this evening. We're aiming to be done in round about an hour's time um, depending on discussion and uh, and the contents that we're, we're about to hear. Um, and uh, this webinar will be recorded and uh, published on the FAS.Scot website for anybody who's unable to, to attend tonight. So hope you enjoy and any questions, please do, do let us know as we go through. Okay. So some quick introductions. Um, there's myself, um, I've already said my, my name's Alexander Perry. Um, I'm a senior consultant and area manager for SAC Consulting, and I'm based out of the Ockham Crew office here in Ayrshire in the southwest of Scotland. But uh, joining me tonight is our senior ecologist, Dr. Lauren Cole, who's also joining us from SAC Consulting Limited, and Dr. Alistair Leek, the director of policy for the AIM and Wildlife Conservation Trust. And like I say, we're going to hear about the hydrocarbon code and some of the development work that, that's gone into that, as well as some of the, the nature conservation benefits of hedges as linear features. If like me, you're a big fan of hedges, you'll understand that hedges provide a, a trifecta of, uh, of benefits. Um, I like to think of them as providing shelter, whether or not that's for um, our vulnerable soils here in Scotland or whether it's for our, our grazing livestock. They're also integral to uh, nature conservation in terms of habitat corridors and habitats in their own right, and, and increasingly recognised for their role in atmospheric carbon capture and sequestration. So uh, we're going to hear a little bit about each of these um, as we go forward tonight. Okay. But uh, I'll get us kicked off here tonight. Um, Alistair, would you like to, to join us and to, to share your screen? Okay, thanks, Alex. Uh, my mouse went missing there for a moment, but now it's back, so I can get going. Um, so good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for the invitation to come and talk to you. Uh, I'm going to deal with the carbon part of hedgerows and a project that we were involved in at the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust's Allerton project, which is our research and demonstration farm in central England. Um, so our mission was to create a hedgerow carbon code uh, and the funding came through the Environment Agency uh, through a fund established by uh, the English government called the Natural Environment Investment Readiness Fund. Now the purpose of this fund was not to do any fundamental new research, but to bring together existing research to create um, in this case, a code which could be used for farmers and landowners to calculate carbon content with a view to potentially trading that going forward. Um, so we work with a number of partners uh, over a number of uh, years, but for this project, uh, two of our larger partners, actually. Uh, the first, uh, Nestle, who we work with a group of 100, 100 farmers in, uh, in Cumbria uh, supplying milk. Um, and these are dairy farmers, obviously. So they're using hedges uh, to keep uh, livestock in, in fields. Uh, but the, perhaps the more interesting uh, partner of this was, was actually Kellogg's, uh, a group of farmers in Northamptonshire in England, which supply the 100,000 tonnes of wheat which goes to make special K. Now, these farms were mixed farms uh, in the past, uh, but they are now all arable. And really, the, the, the hedgerows are a relic of that old production system because there are no livestock to keep in the fields any, any, any longer. Uh, 
that means the hedges uh, have become degraded. Uh, there are gaps in them and they're managed probably rather more harshly. So what we were interested to see was that if we could monetize the carbon in the hedge, this would provide an incentive for farmers to look after them better, allow them to grow bigger, to fill up the gaps and make them a much better habitat feature. So that was the start of our project. Now, uh, all the companies that we deal with are currently looking at their carbon, uh, trying to work out the footprint of making uh, a box of Special K or producing a Kit Kat bar. Um, <clears throat> so both of our clients here are using the Cool Farm tool, which is widely used by the food companies who particularly like to benchmark themselves against each other. But these tools are very much concentrating on the emissions which take place during the production. So, you know, for us growing a ton of wheat, we're going to use diesel to cultivate the soil to power the combine harvester. There's going to be some energy wrapped up in the nitrogen fertilizer that we use. So these are the tools which look to production emissions. Uh, what we're actually interested in our project is where we are locking up the carbon in the ecological infrastructure of the farm. So that's woodlands, that's hedgerows, um, and any other features such as grass margins too, where carbon can actually get locked up. So what we're trying to do is to, to, to create two sets of accounts. The, the first set of accounts is that which is the emissions that come from the crop production, and then there is the counter account, which is that carbon which is locked up in the ecological infrastructure on the farms. And hedgerows, of course, are a really big part of that. So what we did was we set about trying to find as much existing data on hedgerow uh, dimensions so that we create a calculator that was based on the length, the width, and the height of the hedge. And as I said, there were no funds in this for us to do new research. So as you'll see in a minute, there are certain types of hedge management that we haven't been able to, to cover. Um, the calculator that we created, we did actually uh, pilot on Kellogg's origin supply chain. So these are the group of farmers that grow that wheat for, uh, for Special K. Uh, and there's no doubt that although we've got, uh, as far as we have, further investment is going to be needed um, to take it on to the next stage, particularly in terms of the auditing and uh, checking compliance and so on. And before I go into the, the meat of the subject, uh, I need to obviously thank the Natural Environment Investment Readiness Fund for funding this. Uh, Cameron Hubbard, who is a GWCT data scientist, he was the guy who actually put the calculator together. So he's a software engineer in, in, in essence. Um, uh, and Matthew Axe, who did his three-year PhD actually harvesting uh, the carbon out of hedgerows and weighing it so that we have the data to create the calculator. So here are some pictures of hedgerows uh, on some of the farms we're involved in. Here's a very good example of one which has been previously overcut. It is now growing out, but there isn't a great deal of carbon stored in that hedge because it is a relic hedge. It doesn't have to keep livestock in, in field any longer. Uh, it can't be pulled up because it's protected by hedge regulations. So, so my quest is how do we make that hedge so that it can earn money for the farmer? And here's another hedge which has become overshrouded by trees. Uh, the hedge has been fenced now, so that's what's keeping the livestock in the field. As you can see, there are big gaps in that hedge which could do with being planted up so that the hedge could uh, uh, create a solid entity again and lock up more carbon. Here's a hedge which has been planted, but quite clearly in this part of the hedge, the soil's compacted. So the hedge isn't doing at all well, and there's a big gap there. Again, that needs some improvement, and in so doing, we would lock up more, more carbon. And this is actually one of my own hedges on my farm, where uh, the hedge has died and a bramble bush has taken over into the gap. Well, that's actually very good for biodiversity. It's only a small section of the hedge. I'd probably leave that, but if you wanted to lock up more carbon, then you'd be far better off replanting that. But this is what the hedge really should look like. And 
by calculating how much carbon is in the length, the width and the height, we can enter the dimensions into the calculator and that tells us how much carbon is present. And you can see here, this is very normal for us to see in hedges, uh, particularly those that are rapidly growing, where you have a cut line where the hedge has been uh, flailed back, then it's regrown, and the farmer has then cut it at a higher height, each time adding greater dimension and greater carbon storage potential to your, to your hedgerow. So this is an example of the sort of hedge that our calculator won't work for. This is a hedge which has been laid. This is actually very good. You're compressing the carbon into the base of the hedge, creating a really dense structure, which is full of woodiness. Uh, the root structure of this hedge is very well developed. Uh, so it will regrow very rapidly, but about 40% of the carbon that was in that hedge just had to be cut out in order to make that shape. So there's a bit of work that still needs to be done going forward. Uh, how do we calculate the carbon in a hedge which has been laid? And, and likewise, when you coppice a very old, tall hedge, obviously that carbon is then lost, but you can then sequester more carbon as that hedge regrows rapidly and you keep it trimmed with the flail and you can lock up a lot more, lot more carbon from that. Now, interestingly, a lot of the hedges on my farm, we do manage in this way because we have another use for the material. So here we're actually chipping some coppiced hedge um, for biomass, uh, which we put into a grain trailer. Actually, by doing this, we were able to add some more data to the hedgerow carbon code because we can obviously weigh the wood chip uh, that comes from that hedge. So we know how long the hedge is, we know how tall it was, we know how wide it was, we can now go and weigh the, 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 the uh, wood chip from that. But of course we can't claim any carbon credits for it because we're actually going to use it and burn it and return the carbon dioxide back to the atmosphere. But of course we do get paid a um, renewable energy um, premium for using this. So this is another way in which you can manage hedgerows and turn them into something which brings you uh, money uh, back onto the farm. So here's our little calculator. Um, <clears throat> you simply enter the species of hedge, the length, the width and the height, and the calculator will tell you how much carbon is in that. Uh, hedges are um, generally made up of only two species, about 60% of all our hedgerow uh, plants by the hawthorn or blackthorn, so that also helps us in uh, creating this calculator. <clears throat> but of course, the only way you claim uh, carbon credits for your hedges is through additionality. So in other words, if the carbon is already stored in the hedge, the only bit that you can trade is if you manage to allow it to grow bigger. And I have to say, being part of the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust, our hedges are already pretty big. So ours was probably one of the worst farms for us to do a hedgerow carbon calculator on because our ability to generate more carbon is actually very limited. And this is a very typical example of uh, a hedgerow uh, on the farm. Um, interestingly, there is probably some carbon potential in that grass strip at the side of the hedgerow. Uh, we know from work at Rothamsted that where you take arable land, so normally we would have calculated, we would have cultivated that soil right up to the base of the hedge. Uh, if you look there at a field which started arable and carried on arable, you see that the carbon level um, uh, stayed the same. But when the uh, <coughs> crop was, uh, when the margin was turned into grass, the carbon level goes up. So I think there's a, a real argument for us to actually expand this hedgerow carbon code and create a hedgerow space code, which calculates all the carbon that's actually held within that area. The other interesting thing is where the hedge is regularly flailed, there is a huge pool of carbon underneath the hedge in, in, in the little flailings and twigs which have fallen down over the years. In some hedges, we found there was more carbon in the soil underneath the hedge than there was in the hedge itself. 
uh, when I say the soil underneath the hedge, I'm not including the root structure of the hedge. That is already built into the hydrocarbon calculator. This is just in the soil and on the surface uh, around the hedge base. So there's another potential uh, that we could, could add in. So our calculator is now up and running. Uh, we have it working. We've piloted it on some farms. We've now handed this on to an organization called Natural Capital Advisory. Um, they're working with groups of farming, providing environmental auditing, bringing groups of farmers together. But I think most importantly, brokering trading opportunities for farmers. You see, companies like Kellogg's and Nestle don't want to have to deal with individual farmers. They want to inset their carbon footprint within their supply chain or within, within big groups of farmers. And what NCA does is actually bring those farmers together to aggregate the carbon and biodiversity, if that's been traded, uh, to make those trades uh, more easy to do. So there are a number of quite large groups now formed called the environmental farmers groups. And within this, the ambition is that we will use the hedgerow carbon calculator to work out how much carbon is stored in the hedgerows through those groups of farmers. So here's three of the groups, uh, one in the south of England, uh, one in and two others in the, uh, in the Peak District. Uh, so, so far, there are quite a number of trades already completed. None of these have actually been done for hydrocarbon, but obviously that is around the corner once we sort out the auditing and uh, brokering of the deals. Um, and there's one other way in which uh, farmers will be able to trade this going forward is actually on the, on the Karna platform, uh, which allows individual buyers and sellers to trade uh, their carbon, be it from peatland or woodland or hedgerows. So th this is the sort of system that would uh, be useful to an individual farmer because you put your offer on the platform and an individual buyer will contact you to, to make the trade. So Alex, that's me done for now. I think I'm just about within one minute of my 20, so thank you. That's brilliant, Alistair. No, thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure you've gotten a lot of uh, a lot of people a lot of things to to think about there. And um, there was one question that came in very early uh, on in the presentation, Alistair. If you don't mind, I'm just going to field it to you the now, if that's okay. So the right question the question that was asked was, um, what, why is farmed grasslands not included in the in the lockup calculations, and, and what why is it only the, the field margins? Oh, uh, there's no reason why farm grassland could not be included in the overall calculation. And I think this is actually a really important point to make because a lot of people are suggesting that we might get rid of the less productive grassland and plant trees on it. Mm -hmm. But in so doing, we may actually destroy a very big carbon pool without us looking at the impact on the wildlife and particularly the flora of those meadows. You mentioned a, a range of um, carbon calculators at the beginning there. I, I, I know some of them, um, obviously, we have a preference um, towards the, the use of AgriCalc within the, the Farm Advisory Service and FAT Consulting. Um, but I know a, a number of them will calculate your grassland carbon sequestration. Um, so, so options are available. All right, um, Lorna, um, how would you like to get us kicked off on the nature of conservation benefits of hedges? Hopefully I can share my screen. Are we good? Yes, all good. Fantastic. So I love this photo. It's a little solitary bee on a rose in a hedgerow. And you can tell it's a solitary bee because he's got these really, or she's got these really fluffy ginger legs that are ideal for trapping pollen. Um, so, obviously, nature and farming, they are totally dependent on each other. We require all our soil organisms, our fungi, bacteria to recycle nutrients. So 
FVT, dead organic matter, and turn it back into a form that plants can uptake. We have our worms active in the soil, aerating the soil. We've got a whole host of flower visiting insects that help pollinate crops such as field beans, apples, oilseed drape. Then we've got a host of natural enemies. Um, so here we've got a mummified aphid that has been hollowed out and eaten alive by the larvae of parasitic wasps. But we've also got our spiders, beetles, etc. And of course, all these organisms work together to create complex food, food webs. And finally, who doesn't love being a butterfly, for example? It's quite a common butterfly here, the peacock, but it's just so beautiful. And I don't think I'm alone from going out about in farmland and just feeling really happy when I see butterflies or bumblebees or hares, etc. So why do we need diversity? Well, this is just one example of how our wildlife, how the biodiversity works together. So, for example, if we take natural enemies, at the top of the cereal, we've got our ladybirds, we've got hoverfly larvae, we've got parasitic wasps. They're all active controlling pests such as aphids in the cereal. But, of course, quite often when the ladybird approaches, the aphid hits the ground. So... Intercepting that, we've got a range of orb web and sheep web spiders, like this little money spider, and they'll trap the prey as they fall. And finally, we've got a whole host of ground dwelling insects. So we've got ground beetles, wolf spiders. These guys are absolutely fantastic at um, slugs, they feed in slugs, so we eat the eggs of slugs. The way the fallen aphids that have escaped all the other predators. And what we find is that these different organisms, they play slightly different roles. But overall, what we get is the more diverse the number of predators are, the better they are at regulating pests and the more resilient they are to future change. So what about hedgerows? Why should we really care? Well, a really neat study was done by Robert Walton, this ecologist, and he looked at a, a single length of hedgerow of 85 metres, and he decided to record every species he saw within two metres. Now, he made it a little bit easy in his Self and said, I'm only going to see record what I can see by the naked eye. So you didn't have to go into trying to identify bacteria or tiny little mites, but he recorded a massive 2070 species. You can see some of the, he had um, malaise traps, that's the kind of tent like structure, um, and emergence traps, so that goes over the ground and it all get fly pupae as they emerge from the soil, for example. So he recorded amphibians, he recorded lizards, bees, caterpillars, bats, um, mammals, predatory birds, um, beetles, spiders, a whole host of, of animals. And he found not just for the common species, but he identified 40 that are known to be rare or declining, and that included six birds on the red list, so very, very special birds of conservation concern, and five birds on the amber list. So huge amount of um, wildlife recorded in this single hedgerow. Of course, Hedges are not all equal. And what we do see a lot is the hedgerow on the left. So we can see it's gappy. It's been cut quite hard at the same level each year, which has resulted in this kind of like little tiny bonsai trees almost. So what are we looking for 
in a hedgerow? Well, we want lots of species. So if we've got a range of different um, woody flowering plants, for example, these plants will flower for longer. So what we tend to do is the blackthorn will be out first alongside the willow. They'll be out March, April, May. Our hawthorn will come into flower June, the dog rose, and then bramble will be about later on in July and August. So that provides a continual source of pollen and nectar for pollinators, but also a wider diversity of different berries for birds. So diversity is important, structure, and features are also important. So a nice dense hedgerow provides lots of shelter for nesting birds and overwintering species such as a lot of the butterflies, overwintering hedgerows. Features like Callister mentioned, um, you've got a woody, a uh, grassy margin that can provide important bumblebee nesting sites and overwintering sites for ground beetles, um, leaving hedge uh, trees to grow in hedgerows, provide perching sites for um, birds of prey. Putting your hedgerow against ditches provides yet another habitat. And then finally, we have the range of different, of how these habitats interact and connect each other. So this is very much the landscape context. So our little yellow hammer that we see in the middle, it will nest in the hedgerow, it will feed its um, chicks and insects, which it may get from flower-rich field margins. And then as it um, goes into winter, this little bird will be looking for seeds, so it'll go into stubble fields and bird cover. So all the elements within the farmed landscape are ensuring this little bird can be supported. Not just do the different habitats interact with each other, the hedgerows also provide an important tool for navigation. So we know that um, bees will navigate. They quite often are observed flying along hedgerows, as do butterflies. Um, bats use them as foraging habitats. So, and they physically connect habitats. So woody habitats are joined up, allowing species to dive to cross cross our countryside. So Alistair mentioned some of these hedgerows provide a wide array of different benefits. So they prevent nose-to-nose -nose contact in livestock so they can enhance biosecurity. Of course, Alistair's covered the value of hedgerows in sequestering and storing um, carbon. They'll trap Sediments and they'll regulate flood waters, so they'll help protect our water courses from pollution and also they'll help prevent flooding. Um, they can trap airborne pollutants um, such as ammonia and particulate matter from car exhausts. As mentioned, they provide shelter and habitat for natural pests and also for pollinators. They can provide shade and shelter. Alex mentioned how they protect our soils. Um, they can prevent heat stroke in dairy cows and or heat stress rather in dairy cows and exposure in newborn lambs. So there's real benefit to production. And then they've got cultural value. I mean, Hedgerows are just a well-loved feature of our countryside. And there's also some thought that they may trap plant pathogens, so they could actually protect crops from um, disease as well. The good thing is that typically a hedge that's good for wildlife is good for all these other things, so you don't have this trade-off. So a nice, big, thick, species-rich hair 
hedgerow. It's good for everything. So what to look for? What makes a good hedgerow? So here we've got, we want the structure, we want it to be tall, dense, no gaps, lots of different woody plant species. Dodd tree can help, it provides a different element, so it will provide nesting sites for different bird species. It will provide um, roosting sites for bats and perching sites for birds of prey. Um, it's about strategically deciding where you plant, where you let some trees grow up. If you plant it north and south, it means it's less likely to shade crops. Then we've got elements of dead wood. Dead wood is fantastic at providing habitat for a whole lot of um, fungi and different invertebrates feeding on dead wood as well. And then you've got this vegetated buffer. And as Alistair mentioned, that has got value in storing carbon. It's also got value in providing habitat for natural enemies and nesting sites for pollinators. So lots of different features in a hedgerow that makes it good. So we asked um, farmers at the HDB meeting this year, the Agronomy Roadshow in June, what were the barriers to hedgerows? And a number of barriers came up, up and it was things like they didn't have sufficient time money or labour primarily to um, enhance and restore hedgerows. Um, some felt it could be a risk of pests, diseases, they could weeds, they could encroach into the fields. Um, others felt that they found the hedgerows messy. Um, then we also had factors such as we need more evidence that the benefits of them outweigh the costs of maintenance and also identified was a lot of people didn't have the skills to know how to improve the condition. They knew their hedge was, rows weren't great but they didn't know how to make them better. So this is Alice Walker, she's my fantastic PhD student She's doing her research at SRUC and the University of Edinburgh. And Alice has been walking hedgerows in the Midwesian regions to try and determine their value for different insects. So she's graded hedgerows into three types. She's got dense and managed hedgerows. She's got kind of tall, overgrown, leggy hedgerows. And then she's got over trimmed hedgerows that are quite gappy at the bottom. And what she found was that the dense and the overgrown hedgerows had a higher number of hoverfly species than the other types. Now, why should that matter? So we know hoverflies pollinate crops. Oh, Sorry, I've got to say, Alice would kill me. The results are provisional. She's gathering more and more data, so things may change. Um, but ho So we know hoverflies pollinate crops, but I've got a little video, which will hopefully come, that I took when this is a hoverfly larvae. He looks a little bit like a bit of snot, um, and he's munching away at aphids, and this was shot at David Aglin and um, Johnny Balfour's farm at Bulburnie Home Farms. So this wee guy's munching his way through these aphids and quite quickly finished the whole lot. Oh, sorry, that's gone off a bit. So we've seen that um, we've seen that they can enhance the number of um, natural enemies. But what does that do on the ground? Does that relate to any real change in natural enemy pest control? So this is what we did at Preston Hall, the HDB monitor farm, and we paired it up with a neighbouring farm, which was 
operating business as usual. And we looked, we were a little bit mean, let's just say. So we stuck aphids onto bits of cards and we put them out in the crop and tried to determine how many aphids were eaten. So the we can see here we've got a little ladybird that's kind of munched away a big bunch of aphids in this strip. So we compared this against the baseline, which was before Preston Hall had really undergone any change. And this is the number of aphids against the baseline. So we can see in our control farm, the farm that was just operating business as usual, there was a slight increase in the number of aphids eaten, but that's just simply annual variation. However, we can see that this increase was much higher at Preston Hall, which indicates all the environmental improvements that we're undertaking at Preston Hall were actually positively impacting on the pest control services, so the regulation of pests by these natural enemies. So, oh, sorry, we've jumped a bit forward. So some things about um, hedgerow plants. The one thing is a lot of these hedgerow plants have a great desire to become a tree. So we are talking about elder, beech, um, hawthorn. These are really trees. So what that plant wants to do is grow up. It doesn't want to grow out. out. So it needs really careful management to make sure that it just did not grow up. And what tends to happen is if you don't um, manage your hedgerows, they will degenerate at the base. So the base becomes um, structurally unsound and the plant will die, leaving gaps. So to get a dense base, we want to cut regularly. If we increase height by little bits every year, that um, plant will become slightly thicker as well. We want to protect the base by li from livestock and finally we quite often need to rejuvenate either by laying or by coppicing. So here we can see um, a kind of gappy hedgerow, we can see where it's been laying and you can see the kind of branches going across and this is a lovely photo I took just last weekend, my husband was getting really frustrated because I was insisting he stopped in sharp corners while I photographed hedgerows. But you can see this huge big like tree that's growing sideways through the hedge. And that's from previous laying. So you can see what really good stop proofing that that action has. So... Laying is quite a complex um, process. It takes real skill and that can make it expensive to, to do and also very time consuming. An option that's been looked at by um, UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, CH, is to look at wildlife hedge laying. And this is where you're cutting the hedge if you look above, that's your traditional weighing where you're stripping all the branches off, you're intertwining your your um your um branches. But conservation laying is more you're cutting them three quarters of the way through, similar to above, and just nudging them over. Now that can be done with a digger, but it's typically less damaging to do it by hand. And this is a photo of Giles Henry's farm where he's undertaken conservation laying. Much, much cheaper and much, much quicker to do. So seems a win-win, especially when you notice the volume and growth is maintained so you don't have this sudden loss in organic matter. 
you also don't have a loss in flowers and berries. So with traditional laying, you'll get a two to three year dip after where your berries and flowers are less abundant. And it also introduces dead wood, like Alistair was mentioning, the dead wood below the hedgerow. So things like a promising um, a promising way of quickly restoring hedgerows. A plug for next week, we are, we are going to be looking more at the management of hedgerows and also the management of field margins. And we've got some really skilled practitioners so please do come along and join us next Monday on the 26th of February at 7 to 8 p.m. So quick overview, we want to focus on structure, we want dense, wide, tall um, hedgerows. So to do that, we want to rejuvenate them when they start to get um, begin to degenerate at the bottom. Um, we want to cut them every two to three years, increase height and width slightly every year. Um, we want diversity, so gap up with different plant species. Um, also worth noting is that woody plants typically, and most of the woody plants in the hedgerows, don't flower in the first year growth. So they need two or three years growth to flower. So if you cut all your hedgerows in one year, it means that that year you won't get many flowers. You may get them a little bit where they've avoided the cutter. So what we tend to say is cut every two and three years. But if you can stagger cutting across the farm, it means that every bit of the hedgerow in any one year is flowering and producing berries. Then features we want to look at. You want to maximise the different features. So as Alistair mentioned, that vegetated border protects the hedgerow base. It creates a different habitat, providing different resources. As do letting one or two, um, selecting one or two plants and letting them grow up to become trees. Um, landscape, you want to target where you place your hedgerows to connect. You want to buffer habitat so you hedgerows against um, ditches and streams can protect the water courses and see how these habitats can complement each other. So placing a hedgerow next to a flower rich margin can provide nesting sites um, or overwintering sites for pollinators and also floral resources for them. So final little, I'll put a link in the chat. We're trying to collect um, feedback from farmers on the viability of the Scottish government's list of measures. So primarily aimed at arable farms. Um, it would be great if people could spare five minutes to go and add some ideas onto a little online think tank. Password is arable. I will post it in the chat in a minute. And that is me, Finny. Thank you. Brilliant. No, that's that's great. Or no, thank you very much. Um, Alistair, can I can I just bring you back in very quickly? Obviously. You've had the benefit of, of hearing Lorna's presentation secondhand. Is is there any thoughts uh, with regards to what Lorna has discussed that, that maybe tie into some of the discussion earlier on? Uh, well, only really to say that Lorna's absolutely correct with uh, over the diversity of management. And I think from a practical point of view, <clears throat> having that diversity of management is obviously better for the farm business. You, you don't want to be cutting everything every year. But inevitably, when you're cutting a hedge and reducing its size, you're also reducing the amount of carbon. So, you know, uh, we're going to be trading stuff off here. And actually, to be honest with you, I think if, you, if you're if you going to stack carbon trading and biodiversity net gain together, then that is probably the, the biggest win-win that you're going to get. Well, good, good. And um, there was, uh, I'm, I'm just waiting for the slides to, to move on to the, to the Q&A slide. Uh, apologies, folks, there's a bit of a 
delay. There we go. Um, so I'm just going to invite the audience now to, to uh, put their questions into the Q&A or the, the chat. I did notice earlier on somebody did have their hands up um, and I didn't quite catch who it was or, or, or they may have put their hand back down again. Um, so uh, I'll just uh, I'll just pick up with this first question here. Uh, Alistair, is the, the carbon evenly spread within the hedge um, height wise? And the reason for, for asking is that uh, the the, uh, the 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 asker the, the attendee um, has said that uh, they've seen hedges stripped out um, at the bottom um, and uh, and just uh, just keen for your thoughts. Yeah, it's a it's a brilliant question, and and actually I know exactly uh, whoever's asked that is is uh, talking about because I I've seen hedges that have, have suffered from that, uh, but unfortunately I can't answer the question because the the way that we harvest the hedges was was not by Height section, it was by width and length, so we didn't proportion it uh, vertically through the structure of the hedge, if you like. Um, it would be interesting, though. I mean, one thing I didn't mention was there is a possibility to scan hedges using drones, using lidar, uh, and they can actually record the density of the carbon within the hedge. Um, so we 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 could use that as a tool. But, you know, to go back to the point I made right at the outset, we didn't have any research funding within that to check this kind of thing. Do you know that it's interesting that you say that? I'm, I'm sure that's a total coincidence. But uh, this Friday, a couple of colleagues and I will be doing a, a LIDAR trial um, with a, a group of dairy farmers here in Ayrshire. Um, and we will be scanning some of our some of the hedges. So uh, it'll, be, it'll be interesting to see what that, what that looks like. Uh, third question here uh, for you, Alistair. When do you think um, a hedgerow carbon code could be implemented and up and up and running? Uh, that's difficult to say. I think there's two things we, we have to do. Uh, the first one's very simple, and I should have actually mentioned it in my discussion. Um, we have contracted organic farmers and growers to be the verifiers of the code. They already do the peatland code and the woodland code, so they're used to doing it. Um, the way that it would work would be you would register, if you were planting a new hedge, you would register with them and send them a picture of where you plan to, to plant the hedge. And then they would come out after a couple of years to inspect to make sure that you'd actually planted the hedge and then probably do a couple of checks over the 25 years that we reckon it takes a hedge to grow to full height. But there's some more complicated stuff than that to do because in order to trade carbon, you have to meet an international standard. So I think we have to have some kind of audit of our code co conducted by an international body to verify it. So, so right now it's really used for, for companies to inset with their supply chains in an informal basis or for people to use just in that way. But if you're going to go onto international markets and things like that, then it's going to need that next step of investment. Very good. And um, maybe a question for, for both of you, really. I mean, you, you talked a little bit about the species diversity within, within the hedges, both of you. Do you think it matters what species uh, of plants are, are within the hedge as far as a, as far as carbon's concerned? Uh, well, um, not very much. To see, the great thing about hedges is you're containing the carbon within a, a, a given space by managing it. Now, if you were to let a hedge go completely, then as Lorna said, it would be the propensity for the species to turn itself into a tree, the fastest that would determine how much carbon was locked up. But from my perspective, that then ceases to become a hedge in the definition that I'm using. And I think you can get really good dense beech hedges, but they don't have the same value to wildlife as a more diverse hedge, so they don't really produce um, pollen and nectar, for example. So it's, I guess, perhaps more importantly is how the hedge is managed. So you've got something that is really dense and structurally thick rather than a hedge that's all gappy at the bottom. 
stuff. Um, there's actually a, a question here from uh, Kay Clay, um, who is uh, just remarking that, that they've done some gapping up and extending the hedges on, on a sheep farm um, and asking where they go about getting um, grant aids towards um, doing more of this work. Uh, I actually have an answer for this if, if either of you mind me me um, stepping in here. Um, so certainly within Scotland, broadly speaking, there are there are three approaches here. So you could um, you could apply to the Nature Restoration Fund, depending on the scale of the project. Although they tend to like projects that are done at landscape scale that are going to have these kind of broad based impacts. Um, alternatively, the Agri Environment Climate Scheme has opened for its 2024 funding round, um, and uh, hedge hedgerow creation is covered within that. Um, or um, if you want to do something that's quite small scale, um, something like the Woodland Trust's More Hedges scheme may be, a, a, may be an option for you to, to take a look at. Um, but, uh, but thanks very much for that. And by all means, um, if, if you want to have more of a discussion on that, um, if you contact the Farm Advisory Service um, and put in a formal inquiry, I'm more than happy to, to help you out with that. Okay. Oh, there's another one coming here. Um, uh, does the hedge being funded under a grant scheme um, have any bearing on whether or not a hedge should um, or, or should not be able to be traded for, for the hedgerow carbon code? Um, any thoughts on this, Alistair? Yeah, really good question, that, isn't it? You know, uh, we've had this tension constantly with Treasury um, <clears throat> as to whether, you know, if they're, they're, they're using public money to fund something, then then... The, the farmer or landowner then goes and, and trades that separately. Um, I can't speak for Scotland, I'm sorry, but in England, you know, we, we've been arguing with, with the government saying, if you start to talk to farmers about this, what we call clawback, then you're going to put people off going into the scheme. And what we want to do post Brexit is to get as many farmers signing up into this scheme as possible. And you know how stuff goes around. Um, <clears throat> we want people to feel secure that they can get on with this and, and do it. Um, at some time in the future, it's distinctly possible that if we are valuing our hedgerows as we should, both for the carbon and the wildlife they deliver, farmers should be able to monetize that without relying on government to fund it and that would be a wonderful place for us to be because we could use that money for other things um but right now we are not there yet and while <clears throat> we've got so much to do to improve our farmed environments to try to stem the decline in wildlife and so on uh, we would like to see farmers being properly funded and if they are able to make separate trades well good luck to them mm -hmm. Um, Lorna, um, another question here, maybe a bit unfair, but I, I, I've always meant to ask you this. To what extent do you think hedges can remedy nature decline in, in Scotland? What, what, what do you think is their role within a larger picture? I think what they do do is help connect up our countryside. So they create corridors and stepping stones, especially for um species of kind of woodland habitat so the first thing they do would help be to help species move in time of change so if a if a habitat becomes no longer suitable they'll help that they'll help species move into a more suitable habitat so i think they are just one of a whole host of Tools. I think they also provide a lot of different resources. So we saw over 2,000 species using a single hedgerow in um, Devon, I think. Um, so a huge number of resources and species supported. But on top of that, this fact that they can help connect our countryside up. They can help connect wildlife reserves up as well. And Alistair, just, just a question for yourself here. Um, you talked a little bit about um, 
what it is about hedges um, on, on the run up to the webinar, the, the thing that we both like about hedges is that in terms of measuring them, it's quite straightforward um, in, in terms of the, the dimensions and what, what we're actually looking for on the ground. And where do you see the, the carbon calculator thing going more broadly? There's obviously, there's a bit of discussion now about a salt marsh carbon code that's in development. Um, woodland and peatland are, are obviously active and have been for some time. Um, do you think that carbon codes are going to become more widespread within the industry? And is that something, maybe a more general question, is that something that farmers should um, actively uh, be encouraged by? So I think what I, what I said at the outset was, was that we, we've you know, got quite good tools now and your agri-calc is a, is a particularly good one for farmers to work out their emissions. But we, what we haven't done well yet is to work out our sequestration. And, and I think you'll find that there will be something that emerges for a whole range of features so that we can get a better, better handle on that side of the equation. Now, I will just give you an example that, you know, having finished the hedgerow carbon code, we went on to work out how much carbon is stored in beetle banks. Now, you may be familiar with beetle banks, but uh, they're obviously very useful for natural pest control. But, but I showed you how carbon gets sequestered in the grass strip adjacent to the hedge. Well, a beetle bank should actually do that even better because the grass is dying down on the bank every year, building up the carbon stock. The whole idea is that you create a thatch that creates a hibernating habitat for beetles to go through the winter underneath, and that could build up carbon. Now, amazingly, we've now finished that study. And because there is so much carbon in, in, the, in the beetle bank, there is also a huge variety and richness of soil fauna, earthworms, microbes, uh, and they gobble up the carbon. So surprisingly, it doesn't become a very big sink. It goes up for about the first 10 years and then reach, reaches an equilibrium. Right. No, no good stuff. Uh, a lot of, oh, uh, I was going to, to say a lot of really interesting stuff there. And then uh, we have another question here. Um, does a newly planted hedge uh, need deer or rabbit protection or is, is tubing sufficient? Uh, maybe one for yourself, Lorna. I I think deer, rabbit, even bulls can be a real problem um, with newly planted hedges. So I would say fencing may not be enough because um, the bulls will get through. So tree guards or bull guards can help. Um, it's a good idea to try and remove the guards and clean, clean out if you can because the Grass can kind of smother the plants. Also, um, if you don't remove the grass, you get kind of new hedges that are like lollipops a little bit. So, you know, after the hedge has become to establish a bit better to remove the guards so that you don't get these little lollipop hedges. Good, good stuff. All right, folks, um, I'm conscious of, of the time, it's just coming up to eight o'clock now. Um, if there are any other questions, I, I would encourage you to, to get in touch with the Farm Advisory Service and we'll field them back to, to either Alistair or, or Lorna or, or indeed myself. Um, but uh, I think we'll, we'll just move on out of the Q&A. All right, um, so just on the wind down now, I wanted to encourage you to take a chance at, uh, at downloading the, the FAS Companion app. Um, for anybody who hasn't seen this, this is a, a great tool um, and allows you to uh, very quickly unlock some uh, some information directly from the, the FAS website. Uh, we can see that there's some, some features there to do with rotational grazing, slurry FYM calculators, fertilizer costs, forage budgeting analysis, line and, uh, and unit uh, converters. Um, so there's a whole host of, of different options there, as well as technical notes that are available on the fans.scot website, including the one on hedgerow management, um, which was uh, was written a couple of years ago. 
And please do, I know we've come to the to the end of tonight, but uh, in the days following this this webinar, you will be sent a, an email asking for, for feedback on tonight. Um, we're always looking for feedback here at the Farm Advisory Service. It's really important that we continue to develop and improve our approach and our delivery of these webinars, um, including our, our podcast and, and on-site meetings as well. Um, it really helps us to get a sense of what you guys are looking for within the industry and for us to tailor advice that's relevant to you guys that, that's going to get the greatest uptake and, and have the greatest impact. So I um, absolutely encourage you to, to return your your feedback, um, whether it's good, bad, or, or indifferent, we will listen to it all, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll look to, to hear more from you in the future. Um, before I, I leave you tonight, um, I'd just like to, to thank Alistair Leake and Lorna Cole for joining us. Um, Lorna's obviously mentioned that uh, there is a, a follow-up to this event uh, same time next week, I believe, Lorna, um, and uh, we'll hope to, to see some of you back there. Um, just before we, we close off tonight, any final thoughts, Alistair, before we, uh, we leave you? How, how do people get in touch with the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust and, and how do people engage with yourself? Well, I have a, and, uh, um, in Scotland, of course, uh, based uh, around a farm in Aberdeenshire. Um, that's open to for visitors who anybody who'd like to, to arrange a visit, get in touch with them and uh, they'll show you around some of our work north of the border. Thank you. Brilliant. And uh, for Lorna, Lorna Cole, how, how do people get in touch with yourself? Um, through the Farm Advisory Service line or I'm always behind my machine in winter, so drop me an email. Brilliant. Well, on behalf of the Scottish Farm Advisory Service, thank you very much for coming along tonight. Uh, we hope that you've all had a, a great evening been really informative and uh, all the best for the rest of your night. Thank you.